All right. Well, the time has come. Today uh, for our Badger Dairy Insight, we have Dr. Kent Weigel joining us, uh, talking about selection of dairy cows, consistent performance under unpredictable conditions. I'm Ryan Sterry. I'm a regional uh, dairy educator in Northwest Wisconsin. And so um, we'll be helping uh, moderate and host today. So please, if you have questions, uh, enter them into the chat. Uh, but with that, I just wanna do a brief introduction here of Dr. Weigel. Um, he is a professor and chair of the Department of Animal and Dairy Sciences in the UW-Madison. He holds research, extension, and teaching appointments and serves as a technical consultant for numerous companies and organizations in the dairy genetics industry. His research focuses on genetic selection and genome-guided management programs to, produce, to improve the productivity, health, fertility, and feed efficiency of dairy cattle using tools such as whole genome selection, advanced reproductive technologies, crossbreeding, electronic data capture systems, and artificial intelligence algorithms. Dr. Weigel has published approximately 200 peer-reviewed journal articles on various aspects of genetic improvement and management of dairy cattle, and has given lectures to academic, industry, and producer audiences in more than 30 countries. With that, we'll turn it over to you. All right, my screen sharing. Uh, we can see both your screens up there it goes. Okay, great. Thanks, Ryan. And thanks everybody who's uh, uh, braved the weather to sit in front of your computer um, yeah, this morning. So thank you. Uh, what I'd like to do here this morning is uh, I will get into this uh, selection of for consistent performance in unpredictable conditions. That's our current research under a USDA funded grant and a couple other grants. But what I want to do before I do that is to talk about uh, other things happening in genetic selection of dairy cattle in the U.S. And then I'll talk about our feed efficiency research, which has been a huge project. I'll talk, give an update on the status of where that's at, talk about where we're going next with that in methane, and then uh, end with uh, a section on dairy cow resilience and consistency, which is our current research there. So... For those who aren't uh, following this topic regularly, the Council on Dairy Cattle Breeding is the organization that's in charge of genetic evaluations of U.S. dairy cattle. It has been for about a decade. It was something that USDA did before that, and USDA uh, Ag Research Service is really supposed to be doing research. That's kind of the, the main focus, and they decided about a decade ago it was time to get out of the routine genetic evaluation business, transferred that uh, outreach or service piece to CDCB. And so a lot of the research is still done at USDA by the scientists there. And then the genetic evaluations, the national database, all that is maintained by uh, folks down the road, uh, a few miles at Council on Dairy Cattle Breeding there in Maryland. And so they maintain the database for milk recording, health traits, genomic data. I think there are about 8 million, uh, maybe a little more than 8 million genotypes in there from animal people who have genomic tested their animals and so on, and then provides estimated breeding values for cows, bulls, heifers, and calves for you know, close to 50 traits. All this is combined in the Lifetime Net Merit Index. Uh, this pretty pie chart here explains it, but the important part is that it's evolved over time to become a holistic measure of lifetime net profit of an animal or expected lifetime net profit of an animal's offspring relative to breed average. And so we've got income traits in there, um, fat and protein yield primarily, um, a piece of productive life arguably is also, um, it's favorably correlated with production. So a piece of that would increase production. And then there are also, then there are about the other half or so are expense traits everything ranging from survival, which is measured as livability and the productive life, sort of do they survive the, um, you know, from one lactation to the next? How long do they stay in the herd? Fertility traits, says cow and heifer conception rate, calving ability, which includes stillbirths and calving ease, uh, age at first calving, and so on. 
Um, early postpartum health traits are a more recent contribution. That's something that we are involved in, uh, have been involved in over the years. And then residual feed intake now is a piece of this as well. And I'll talk about that when we get to feed efficiency. So as these traits have been added, like feed saved, which is a measure of efficiency, uh, age of first calving, heifer livability, the idea is, is to continue getting this breeding goal closer and closer to what uh, farmers uh, experience on the farm in terms of profitability. So make sure that we're measuring all of the things that contribute or will contribute in the future to the income or expenses and trying to do that in, a, in an accurate way. Uh, I do wanna mention just very briefly another piece of this, which are genetic defects. Um, these are maintained by the breed associations, in this case, uh, Holstein, but other breed associations will be responsible for uh, sort of wrangling the genetic defects in their breeds. The most recent of these that's getting a lot of attention, and it's only gonna get one slide today, and, and I'll talk about why, is this early onset muscle weakness. It's, I say the latest genetic disorder identified using genomics, which is really the case because, um, so this this defect uh, affects the calf's ability to stand and remain standing. It's, um, you know, relatively infrequent affected animals, you know, less than half a percent, maybe even less than that. It's hard to tell exactly if animals don't survive. Depends on how well people are recording this. Uh, about 12% are carriers. Most animals are non-carriers. Uh, I personally tend not to worry too much about these genetic defects because we can identify them at a really uh, frequent rate or easy rate now with with genomics uh, if we rec if we can identify animals as being affected the challenge is when these conditions look like something that management could cause and that you know especially calf traits and things that relate to calf health and survival often uh, calf deaths or health problems will be blamed on management it's hard to tell if it's a genetic uh, origin but if we can identify it as something that's happening uh, across farms, across families, then it's pretty easy to find that now with genomics and, and use um, sort of weed out uh, non uh, weed out the carriers from the AI bull population and use that information in mating programs. So I just wanted to put that in there. It's something that is is relevant now, and you might see news articles about it. Um, but we'll see these every couple of years now, if not even more. Uh, what other things are coming soon to add to that pie chart? Uh, there's a lot of work being done with Council on Dairy Cattle Breeding at, uh, with University of Minnesota and others on developing a pipeline to collect hoof health data. We've done, in my opinion, quite a good job of improving production traits over time, uh, improving physical conformation, so udder traits in particular. We've made a huge improvement over the last uh, years or decades in utter confirmation of dairy cows, we can change milk composition, those sort of things. The mobility traits have been a challenge because they're more influenced by housing and management, hoof trimming and that sort of thing. So I think this reflects that effort to get accurate hoof health data from farms and from hoof trimmers. And, and we can now do some of this with computer vision as well with uh, video of animals walking, we can measure uh, lameness and other uh, lameness and locomotion and one of our faculty, Joao Doria, is working quite a lot on that as, as are other people. Uh, milking speed is another one as we can pull milking times from parlor software or our automatic milking systems. Uh, that's a, a trait that is really related to labor efficiency or, or capital efficiency, essentially efficiency of the milking parlor. And you know, CDCB is developing a pipeline to do that. It sounds relatively straightforward. It's gets tricky when you start combining data across different manufacturers and trying to do that in an objective way. And so this continues the trend of adding health traits and labor efficiency traits. I think we'll see more things related to lameness. We'll see things related to um, adaptability to parlor to to uh, automatic automatic milking systems, and then. Um, you know, calf traits are, are another one that we haven't made as much progress as we should, and we'll see more effort in that area in the future. So I just want to kind of give an update there on what's happening with some of the new things through Council on Dairy Cattle Breeding. We are not necessarily involved. We're involved in some of those, but not all of them. 
I'll talk a little bit about feed efficiency here and, and then briefly methane and then talk about this resilience or consistency. So feed efficiency, we've been working on for about a decade here. We were part of the first USDA grant uh, a little more than a decade ago to start establishing this uh, reference population for improving feed efficiency in dairy cattle. And so, as you well know, and, and some probably better than I do, if you have a background in nutrition, uh, gross energy that's consumed in feed can be lost in a variety of ways, uh, uh, feces, gas, urine, heat associated with digestion and metabolism. There's net energy that's left after those losses, uh, but then there's also maintenance costs or, or uh, that, that are associated with that. So this uh, piece that's captured as milk secreted or as growth addition of body tissue is really what we want to uh, maximize and we want to minimize the losses through these other um, paths, okay? And we can measure that in a variety of ways. Uh, in uh, other species where you have feedlot animals, for example, you can do very simple things like feed to gain or gain to feed ratios. And the analogy in dairy cattle is the milk to feed ratio. But that's fine as sort of a rough measure of efficiency. It's very simple, easy to interpret. It doesn't count for differences in milk composition. Of course, you could do energy corrected milk here or fat corrected milk. It also doesn't account for differences in the energy of the diet. And so it's hard to sometimes compare things between farms or over time. So we can do better than that. Um, we can look at on an energy basis, the energy that goes to milk and body tissue as a ratio of dry matter consumed that can account for the milk composition and the diet differences, as I mentioned. So that's that's an improvement. Um, and why are we looking at this? And one could argue, well, we've been improving efficiency by increasing production, and you would be right. Uh, this is a graph from Mike Vandahar, our collaborator at Michigan State. And when you start looking at these multiples of maintenance, how much energy is going to the product versus the energy that's going to maintain the animal not in a lactating state, you can see this curve starts to level off. And this is why we're doing it, right? So as a cow goes to three, four, five multiples of maintenance, uh, we see that additional gain in efficiency is declining each time. And then if we account for the rate of passage or lower digestibility at high levels of intake, it really starts to level off. And that's why we're doing this now and trying to look at biological differences between cows and feed efficiency. Uh, like I said, we started this now uh, 12, 13 years ago. We're the single largest data provider to the national database, the single largest data collector in the world in, in terms of feed efficiency data. Uh, most, of, most of this coming from Arlington. Uh, Iowa State's a big participant, Michigan State as well, Florida, and then USDA. And the idea is national genetic evaluation. That was the goal when we started this. Can we measure feed efficiency in a, in a group of research animals, use this for selection on a national basis by then matching the genomes of the calves around the country or around the world with those of our research animals and therefore being able to predict their efficiency without measuring it directly. And it works uh, quite well. We measure them between 50 and 200 days postpartum. So in mid lactation, when they're not gaining or losing a lot of body weight, it's uh, it's messy at the beginning of lactation when the cow is in negative energy balance. At the end of lactation, you can have uh, energy requirements of the fetus or the calf. And measuring in, in, it's pretty stable in mid lactation. So we try to get six weeks in mid lactation using these electronic feed intake bins, uh, like you see in the picture there. Pair that up with the daily milk weights and weekly milk composition and, and repeated measures of body weights, and then we can get to uh, residual feed intake. So comparing the actual intake of the animal on a given day uh, can be done on a dry matter basis. We usually do it that way. It can be done on an energy basis. doesn't really matter. Um, and you're comparing the, the actual intake with the expectation based on how much energy she secreted in milk and then what she's needing for growth and maintenance, okay? Accounts for all the difference in milk composition, energy context, content, also management factors. Uh, we're, we have animals in here in uh, Madison. Uh, right now, literally, when it's below zero, we have animals in August in Gainesville, Florida, 
and we're trying to use all of that data together. And so we want to compare animals, same time, same conditions with each other. And, and it works quite well that way. Uh, it works less well when we try to sort of compare it based on you know book requirements, that sort of thing. So we're doing it all on a, on a cohort basis. Uh, and you always have at least, in our case, 64 animals at a time. Sometimes it's different at the other stations. Um, but we always have enough animals that we can compare what one animal is doing relative to other animals adjusted for body size and, and milk composition. And we get uh, pretty graphs like this where we can have animals that are uh, efficient, so low RFI, negative RFI, and they can be uh, first lactation or later lactation. They can be low or high producing. And of course, the ideal animals would be the high producing ones that are also uh, uh, negative RFI, right? And this then, uh, as of now, um, just over three years ago, became official genetic evaluations for feed saved. And feed saved is a composite of residual feed intake, which I just explained, you know, the, the intake relative actual versus expected, and then body weight. And, and the reason we put those together is that residual feed intake is adjusted for body size. So you can have bigger small cows that are, um, are efficient by RFI measures, but the actual maintenance costs are big, are more for those larger animals. And so a separate sort of penalty for uh, animals that are bigger than they need to be is part of this as well. And so we learned some things. Actually, one of the things is that the cost of extra body size is more than we thought it was based on uh, the literature by doing this study. And, and so this selection favors biologically efficient cows that use the feed effectively, but also uh, animals that are medium, medium size. And so every animal cow or bull gets a PTA for feed saved. And, and if it's positive, that means they eat less feed than, than expected uh, on a dry matter basis for lactation and, and reverse it, it's, it's negative. So one of the cool things I want to get away from sort of what's routinely happening into what's happening now is we've been able to do some really cool things with feeding behavior. And we have these uh, blue feeders, as we call them, the instant deck uh, uh, feeders from the Netherlands. And we can not only see how much an animal eats every day, but we can see exactly when she ate, uh, how many meal, how many uh, visits to the feeder, how many meals, uh, how fast she's eating, uh, when she's eating throughout the day, all that sort of stuff. And so we have feeder visits, which is just she went in the feeder, ate something and left. And then we have meals because cows often you know, stick their head in, pull their head back out, stick their head in again. And so a meal is like a batch of consecutive visits that are, are done over a period of time. That period of time is usually about 25 minutes is what a meal uh, duration is on average. But there's variation between animals. And one of the things that we wanted to look at is what behavioral variables relate to feed efficiency. And so Ligia Cavani, one of our postdocs, uh, published this paper now about a year and a half ago, where she showed that uh, feeding rate is actually pretty significantly related to feed efficiency. The animals that have um, not only high intake per meal, but a very fast feeding rate per meal or per visit tend to have positive residual feed intake, which means they're less efficient, okay? Uh, smaller meals tend to be more efficient. Um, we don't know exactly the reason for that, but presumably it has to do with the signaling of the brain telling the animal that, okay, time to stop eating. And if you eat quickly enough, because you probably heard this in, um, you know, said in humans as well, smaller meals eat more slowly. You tend to, to um, eat less because you allow your brain time to recognize um, that hunger has been satisfied, right? And so that's been a really cool project and having um, about 75,000 meal records from 1,300 cows at, at UW-Madison, she was able to do that work. A related study by Barbara, one of our other uh, postdocs, uh, is using data from UW-Madison and University of Florida to look at behavioral data. So we've got this smart bow system at, at Arlington, which is ear tag based. And then they also have the activity system at University of Florida. And from these, we can look at rumination, lying time, activity. And so she looked at 
uh, rumination and lying time of cows at UW Madison, and then activity time uh, in activity measured as steps per day in cows at University of Florida. And the, the interesting thing, if you look at the graph on the upper right, is that animals that are genetically um, predisposed to more activity, so they're spending uh, more steps per day, uh, tend to be less efficient. They're having higher residual feed intake, so uh, more activity, less efficiency, which kind of makes sense, right? They're, in a way, wasting time or wasting energy walking around. And then we see the, uh, the opposite for lying time in the Florida data. So the cows that have more lying time tend to be more efficient. This, I think, would be consistent with what what consultants, nutrition consultants would say you want cows to have adequate lying time and, and it gives them time to digest the feed and be more efficient. The last graph, rumination um, time, I'm not too concerned about what it's basically saying is that more rumination means you're less efficient. But the, the caveat there is that if you eat more feed, you have to ruminate more. So I think the cause and effect are actually the other way around. If you're inefficient, you're eating more feed than you need, then you're also ruminating more because, well, you have to do something with it, right? But the first two graphs there are quite uh, novel. This should be published here in the next, it was submitted to Journal of Dairy Science, will be coming out here relatively soon uh, to look at that relationship between activity and lying time and efficiency. And that's some very cool stuff that Faith uh, Reyes, who did, who now works at the uh, Division of Extension in the Northwest part of the state, um, looked at social competition and feed efficiency. We jokingly call her her PhD work the Hunger Games. Um, but looking at social dynamics between animals in terms of how you group them, how much they compete with each other, and that what does that do to feed efficiency? So one of her studies she did uh, sort of what we call two by two factorial design, which is uh, have groups or have animals of first or later lactation and then have groups formed of either animals that are the same age or same parity or those that are mixed. And so what she found were some interesting things. That th there wasn't much difference in competition behavior between when older young older cows were with older cows or when the young cows are with the young cows. But when you mix them, you did see more competitive behaviors because you had this mixture of uh, older cows and younger cows and, and that caused more competition. Uh, in a sense, uh, the, the older animals actually uh, you know, probably know their, their pecking order, if you will, a little bit uh, more clearly when you mix younger animals in there, it, it uh, causes a little more chaos in there and we have more competition behavior. Um, the older multiparous cows eat more, of course, they have fewer visits per meal, um, so they have uh, fewer visits, longer meals. We've known that from other studies over the years, but when you when you mix the the groups up by age and you have older and younger cows in there together, not only do you have more competition, but you have more bunk visits. They're, they're having to go to the bunk more often. When they do get there, they tend to stay longer. And, uh, and that's probably related to competition as well. We don't want to give up their space at the bunk. And so pretty interesting, pretty interesting study. Uh, she also looked at social networks among these, and these will make my head hurt a bit, but they are uh, interesting in the sense that what you see, uh, the red are the first lactation animals, the blue are the later lactation animals, and then the one that's got red and blue are the mixed, is a, is a mixed group of young and older animals. And you can see a couple of things. One of the things that sticks out is you have a couple of animals like uh, N10 there in blue or X5 there in blue, who just don't interact much with anybody. They're sort of the loners, I guess, if you will. Uh, M1 as well, they don't have too many interactions. Uh, they, they um, uh, and some of this can relate to latency, how aggressively do they go to the bunk when the feed is delivered and, and compete versus they you know, sit back and just wait their turn. But what you can see uh, is the arrows indicate who's, causing the interaction, the actor, and then who's receiving the interaction, who's, who's getting acted upon. And the thicker arrows indicate that they interact more often. So you've got uh, in the mixed parity group there at the bottom, those two, two cows at the top, X7 and X3, are, are going back and forth, interacting a lot. Uh, either they're you know, best friends or siblings or mortal enemies, we don't really know. 
but um, you, you can see more interactions in that mixed group, more competitive interactions as we as we talked about in the previous slide. And so it's a very cool way to sort of look at what uh, is happening there uh, when you've got groups of animals mixed differently. And then the last one she did was to look at stocking density treatments. Two to one, so eight cows to eight bins. This is after you uh, withhold feed for a little while, then you let them loose, and so you can have eight cows into eight bins. You can have uh, 16 cows to eight, so two to one stocking density, and then you can have 16 cows to four bins, so four to one. And you know some of the things are not, not surprising, right? As you increase stocking density, the latency is very greater. You have to wait or wait longer simply because the bins aren't available, so you don't have a choice. Uh, eating rate goes up. So when you get in that bin, if the stocking density is um, more dense, then when you get a bin, you eat quickly because it's your turn, right? Um, total dry matter and eating time go down, though, because there's this issue of, of bunk access. And so uh, this, the summary is the cows change their feeding patterns. They change their eating rate. They change the number of visits, and they have to sort of adjust. And they can't really, they try to compensate for uh, less access um, to the bunk by eating faster and having more visits, but they can't completely compensate for that. So I'll stop there with feed efficiency. I just wanted to give an update on, because we've had a bunch of different projects going on and, and publications coming out that go sort of above and beyond the routine delivery of genetic evaluations for feed intake. I'll talk briefly about this greener cattle initiative. This is the new, uh, really the, the next step from that feed efficiency work that we've been doing for a decade, and that's to look at meth enteric methane emissions. This is a, a broad issue in terms of um, uh, global warming, climate change, because methane is a contributor to that, and enteric methane is a, is a significant source. Uh, enteric methane from ruminant livestock as they digest uh, feedstuff. And so the way we can measure this in a couple of different ways. So this grant, uh, this is a big grant from the Foundation for Food and Agriculture Research. My colleague Francisco Peña Garcano is the leader of that. He's here at UW Madison. We have the same partners as before, Iowa State, Michigan State, uh, USDA, Florida, and us. And again, we're the, the biggest data provider. We're doing this with these green feed systems. So you can see a kind of a picture of one there and then a diagram on the upper right. Uh, there are also other ways you can measure with uh, sniffers um, in, in the uh, robotic milking systems. That's pretty common in Europe, uh, some of those in Canada as well. The sniffers are, are just basically gas measurement wands. They can give you kind of a rough estimate of methane, the, the gold standard is this, well, gold standard is actually putting them in an environmental chamber, which is impossible, you know, to do for more than, you know, a handful of animals. So the green feed system has become super popular, and we've purchased about half a dozen of these, and also Dairy Forage Center here in Madison has several of them. And what happens is you put pellets in there, uh, alfalfa pellets to entice the cow to go in there. We just set up two of these in the corner of the pre salt bin. Cows go over voluntarily. Some pellets drop out when the if it's the cow's turn to be measured. I'll explain that in a minute. She can go in there. Pellets drop. She eats the pellets. Gas flow flows across or air flows across. Measures methane and CO two uh, through the sensors, and then it keeps dropping pellets every um, you know certain interval, thirty seconds, something like that, to keep the cow in there as long as possible, and then. There's a limit to how long she can stay and how many drops of pellets she can get. So after a while, she doesn't get any more. She has to leave and she can't come back for a couple hours and get more. And so we ensure that everybody gets a turn. That works really, really well. Um, we're setting these up uh, on our farm, uh, Dairy Forage Center, Marshfield. And also we're putting a couple on a commercial farm out at Rosie Lane uh, as well to measure cows there. The idea is to replicate what we've done for feed efficiency about 4,000 lactating cows across these six stations over three years. Measure methane, try and improve that soup selective breeding, uh, evaluate uh, what we can learn from the chemical composition of the milk through the milk spectral analysis, predict emissions that could be done on commercial farms if it works, 
and then look at the microbiology of it. So taking rumen samples with um, uh, rumen tubes from high and low methane emitters, seeing what's different about the microbial populations in those animals. And we, we know that that has an effect because we can, um, we have high and low emitting cows. You can actually, if you have rumen cannulas, which we have about 50 of those cows with the window in the side, you can exchange rumen contents and the cow actually controls the genetics. She'll change the composition of the room. She'll change it back after a couple of weeks if you give her somebody else's microbes. There's studies on things like seeding the rumen populations of calves uh, that might work as well, and also nutritional intervention. So this is a huge project that we'll be working on that you'll hear more in the coming years. And I think this is the last slide on methane. So this is one uh, batch of cows that uh, from a recent experiment, just to give you an idea what these data look like, we've got cows that are about 350 grams of methane a day, uh, cows that are up over, uh, you know, on 600 a day, and these have anywhere from, you know, a dozen to 150 visits to that green feed system that are part of these data. So there is variation among animals. It is genetic um, between families, and we think we can make some progress through selection, sorry, on direction. So resilience, uh, what's uh, the advertised topic? And I'm gonna talk about that for the rest of the time. Fiona, uh, my uh, PhD student is the leading of this, leading this effort. She was on a minute ago. I don't know if she's uh, still in the audience. Uh, she can correct me if I say something wrong. Um, so resilience is a hot topic in a number of areas. Certainly it is in crop science. There's been work in <clears throat> pigs and chickens and now more recently, dairy cattle, some good work in the Netherlands, and now we're trying to do it here in the U.S. as well. And the idea is that we've been selecting and managing, but in our case, I'm a genetist, we've been selecting animals that perform well uh, under optimal conditions or as close to optimal as we can get. And that's great, except that the conditions aren't always optimal or perfect, right? We have problems with uh, droughts. We have problems with, uh, you know, rainstorms, you know, we have below zero weather, like right now, we have supply chain problems, we experienced that during COVID, we have labor shortages, and so you can have differences in feed quality, availability, availability of certain feedstuffs, you can have, um, you know, challenges with uh, equip getting equipment, you can have labor turnover, and all of these things affect the animal's environment. And so this schematic on the right is uh, this little figure is from the physical sciences, um, but it sort of demonstrates this concept of resilience. So uh, high resilient uh, systems would sort of be flexible uh, to accommodate a, a perturbation or a, a, a challenge, and then you would bounce back, whereas a low resilient system would be very inflexible. Uh, high resilience individuals would recover quickly after a problem, uh, low resilience would recover slowly. And then you can have these sort of, um, they, some of this gets a little technical, these things like uh, autocorrelations over time, that really relates to recovery rate, and then cross-correlation between systems. You, if you, what you want for resilience is if one thing goes wrong, everything doesn't go wrong, and if there's a low resilient uh, individual system, uh, the opposite happens, like you have one problem and then everything falls apart. And so the idea is, can we look at this in dairy cattle and differentiate them? And this goes back to this anonymous cow. I think I wrote some extension articles 10, 15 years ago about uh, cap keys and this cow called Granny that at the time, and, and maybe still was the lifetime national production leader. Uh, and with the uh, you know, 400 and some thousand pounds of milk, I don't remember. And it was the comment that uh, one of the um, family made was that they, they didn't recognize this cow until she was like eight years old. She was just out there in freestyle and nobody paying attention to her. And all of a sudden they looked and like this cow had a calf every year on time, never had a health problem, never a problem of any kind. And uh, if you have a whole herd of those, then obviously that makes you, or many cows like that, that makes you labor efficient. It reduces your vet bills. It allows sort of more consistent income over time and, and really this uh, thesis or idea is that was anomic anonymous cows are apparently resilient because they're uh, consistently performing. 
Uh, this slide I like because Fiona made it and she's Irish and there apparently is this sport in Ireland called hurling. Uh, uh, I heard of hurling in uh, our terminology sometimes means something different, but this is an actual sport. Um, and uh, so the idea is that these two players uh, of this sport, uh, which Fiona plays as well, are either consistent or inconsistent. The one on the left uh, scores uh, lots of goals, uh, but not consistently and uh, against less challenging opponents, this individual scores lots of goals. And when they play a challenging team, uh, doesn't score many goals at all. And we could all imagine maybe uh, uh, quarterbacks of our favorite football teams that have been like this, maybe even some that have worked in the Green Bay uh, that uh, tend to put up very nice numbers against in low quality opponents and then struggle a little bit against uh, tough defenses, right? Whereas the player on the right, very consistent, doesn't matter are you uh, playing a, a challenging team or not, uh, you get three goals per per match uh, no matter what, right? And that's kind of a, a, a better goal or a more resilient uh, situation. So uh, in her recent study that uh, we published last year, she worked with Dairy Records Management Systems, had about uh, 300 million daily milk records uh, from uh, 300 about 311 large herds uh, around the country, a little over half a million cows. And so we're getting daily milk weights from the parlor. And then there's some uh, getting in every individual milking now. Previous to that, we only had some daily values from about 80 million animals. So this uh, comprised about 22 million test herd test dates. Uh, there are health records of these animal breeding records too, but the idea is to look at daily milk yield and how does that uh, relate to, or how does that differ between animals and is it consistent for some, less consistent for others? Excuse me. Um, so one of the things you have to do with dairy cows because they follow, their, their performance follows a lactation curve is you don't expect the performance every day to be the same. You expect the performance, you know, to go up uh, for the first, uh, you know, 60, 70 days of lactation and then kind of level off and then start to decline over time. So she put some different curves to predict their performance. The details of this aren't important, just that uh, you want to fit an expected curve to the daily performance of each animal. Uh, so tricky, you have to do this on an animal by animal basis, uh, but then also you don't want to, copy the data exactly, and uh, you want to have um, the ability of an animal to have variation from that curve day to day as well. And then this, we call temp var temporal variance. So variance day to day over time is what we're trying to measure. And so here's a consistent cow uh, that uh, you could see her lactation curve there, and then she sort of you know, varies above and below the curve, you know, five, 10 pounds most days. Um, you know, there are a few that are a little more than that, but you really don't see any wild deviations from it throughout her lactation. And you don't see, um, you know, periods of time where she's above and periods of time where she's below. She's just really consistent over time. And that's what we would consider as a consistent or resilient cow, as opposed to her friend here, as it is uh, wildly inconsistent. You have individual days that are bouncing around, but what's most important, if you see around a, a 95 days in milk, she apparently was sick. She dropped in performance there for, for a while. And then about 115 or so, 120, a big drop that took, took about a month to recover uh, her performance there. And so this inconsistency, um, what does that mean? Well, certainly it means more milk to sell some days, less on others, which would sort of average out over time across, or average out across all the cows. But but what it really means is more labor involved because these things you know don't happen without uh, health problems and stuff too. So these cows that are inconsistent are causing more management uh, needs and more labor needs. So that's kind of the economic value of consistency. And so she looked at. Uh, how is this consistency of daily milk yield here? And the, the high variance animals are sort of undesirable. So the scale backwards in a sense, uh, 
but what you see then is these negative relationships with productive life, livability, and daughter pregnancy rate are actually good. So that means the cows that are less variable day to day tend to have longer productive life, uh, uh, greater livability, better fertility. So more consistent animals, put it to put it another way, more consistent animals have fewer health problems, uh, improved fertility than their inconsistent herd mates. And so uh, this is something that we're trying to work toward a prototype for a national genetic evaluation system looking at the consistency of daily milk yield. Uh, another thing that happens, uh, and this is uh, Fiona and we collectively are struggling with this, is as you might expect, there's a relationship between pen changes or pen moves and consistency. So this uh, consistent cow that I shared earlier, you know, visited one pen for the first 120 days, a different pen for the next couple hundred or you know, 180 days, and then sort of you know moved into a third pen right before uh, right at the end of lactation, uh, which is which is again nice in terms of labor efficiency and, and management efficiency. Um, and so we believe consistent cows don't change pens as much as inconsistent cows in the lactation. And then her inconsistent friend is all you know has visited uh, let's see eight different pens and spent time in in these pens throughout the lactation, and that's tends to be associated with uh, inconsistency. So more, oops, um, more pens, um, pen moves less consistent. The challenge is that the, the pen allocation structure varies so much from farm to farm in terms of how many pens you have. Uh, there's some inconsistency in the way animals are assigned to pens, but usually it's related to either age, uh, production level, or pregnancy status. But really the bigger challenge is just why are animals moving? They might be moving because it's their fault. They might be moving just because you need space or things like that. And then, of course, uh, another challenge we run into with this kind of research is that uh, in some cases, if you have a different parlor for the hospital pen, the animals might disappear for a while and come back and we miss some data on them that way. But uh, this is kind of a work in progress. <clears throat> we also can see potentially differences in consistency of feed intake. This is a recent study, <coughs> excuse me, where uh, in our feed efficiency project, you could see five cows that are on the left that are quite consistent day to day throughout the, the trial, which is about 10 weeks long. The one on the right, we had some feed quality problems, moved to a new silage bag about halfway through, and you could see some of the cows had some major drops in their intake, but other cows uh, on the left were completely unaffected. So. Again, Ligia Arcavani, our postdoc, was looking at this. How is genetically consistency of dry matter intake related to efficiency? She took the same sort of approach as Fiona. And, and what you see in these genetic correlations is that the inconsistent animals are also inefficient. So that's a good thing that as we try to improve feed intake, we try to improve consistency of performance and feed efficiency, those things are, are um, positively associated with each other and not fighting against each other. So some take home messages uh, overall, kind of where we're at in terms of, of genetic selection broadly in dairy cattle, we're trying to, we've done a great job improving income traits and we keep trying to do a better and better job of reducing the expense traits. Um, initially, that was, you know, somatic cell uh, and productive life. Then it became also female fertility, calving ability, then early postpartum health traits, uh, now feed efficiency, and trying to add to that things, uh, better measures of mobility, locomotion, milking speed in AMS systems, and uh, so on. You know, one of these is that those traits have direct economic value. Uh, consistency, we think, has economic value that's direct, uh, that relates to labor efficiency, also has indirect economic value through vet bills, that sort of thing. But some of those we could pick up anyway through the health trait evaluation. Uh, the real bugger in terms of the economic values in selection is methane. If we collectively 
want to reduce methane emissions or are told by the government or by um, food companies who are buying the product that we need to reduce indirect methane emissions. Um, you know, that's important. How does that turn into an economic value? What's the what's the dollars per or dollars or cents per gram of methane per day value? And, and we don't know that yet, but, but that's something we have to try and figure out. Uh, what I think Mike Ristobal would say is likely is you're going to have a sort of a, a portfolio of ways to reduce methane emissions, whether it's by selection or by feeding practices or other things. And then buyers of milk are going to say, you know, we want you to implement a few of these. What are you doing to put, sort of help the problem? But we'll figure that out here in the coming years. So we're trying to study that inherent inheritance of methane emissions, uh, trying to understand uh, more deeply this relationship between behavior and efficiency because it's real. And um, we can measure that in our electronic system. We can also measure it with uh, cameras and computer vision and trying to understand those dynamics that have both genetic uh, but also management implications. And then trying to develop these metrics for measuring resilience. We, we believe resilience is important. The consistency is one piece of that resilience. Uh, the other piece of it is harder. And this is what Fiona is working on now is how do we identify um, perturbations or management disturbances, environmental disturbances, and look at individual animals reaction to that. We know from work done like at University of Georgia previously that there is genetic variation in heat stress. So animals that are more thermal tolerant will tend to have heat stress that starts at a higher level and the drop in performance will be slower. Whereas animals that are uh, poor thermal tolerance will uh, get heat stressed at lower temperature humidity index and have a, a more steep drop in performance. Other measures of environmental disturbances are, are harder to come by, and, and so we're looking at ways to detect those. Uh, something's happening to the group. Why did performance of some animals uh, drop and uh, others were not affected? And, and if they dropped, how quickly did they recover? That's sort of what we're trying to get at. And it's, a, it's a tricky area, but it's very cool also. Uh, I'm going to stop yapping at this point, and... Uh, we can try and answer some questions. I think Ryan wants to talk a little bit about maybe some upcoming programs first. Is that correct, Ryan? I can make those two announcements real quick now. And yes, um, I had a couple of follow-up questions and um, there was a comment in the QA that's uh, curious about the pictures in your background. Um, so, but um, for the announcements, uh, our next Badger Dairy Insight is gonna be on February 20th. Our guest is gonna be Dr. Sebastian Ariola uh, with UW-Madison talking about balancing diets for energy uh, and amino acids to maximize milk components. And around the same time uh, in February, February 19th through 23rd is gonna be our reproduction Roadshow with Dr. Fricky and Dr. Martins. Uh, we have locations in the Darlington, River Falls, Barron, Edgar, Manitowoc, and Wanakee areas. If you're interested in that, if you go to our dairy.extension.wist.edu uh, website link there that's right up on the slide here, uh, that'll get you uh, to the registration or information for both of those programs. Um, if you still have a few minutes, um, I did have uh, two follow-up questions, um, and one ties into your closing comments there uh, with the consistency versus inconsistency in daily milk yield. Um, are you to the point yet um, of knowing how many of those events can be tied to a specific event, whether it's heat stress or a health event, or some of those drops happening and we just don't know why yet? I'd say we are still at the don't know why stage, and how do we how do we measure it objectively, right? You can sort of, there are two approaches. You can try to measure um, things that we think will cause disturbances. So, you know, the easy is the temperature humidity index because we can go to the weather station data, right? Uh, or we can even uh, put uh, sensors in the barn because some farms do a better job of heat abatement than others. Um, some of the others are harder to measure, right? You can't sort of get objective measures of the environment across a bunch of farms, you know, on a daily basis. So some of these we have to try to detect from the data. So if you say, okay, 
uh, identifying by pen is really important. So Fiona's was uh, focused on that because on big farms, you can have things that may affect one pen and not others. So make pen sort of our cohort and then say, okay, on any given day, uh, was something weird happening in that pen? And so you can detect, okay, in pen seven, uh, a third of the cows, you know, dropped in intake or dropped in yield on that day or in that week, uh, something must have happened. And then, um, you know, among those, you have some cows that were affected a lot and some cows that were affected a little or, or not at all. And so uh, I think a combination of the two, if I had to sort of crystal ball, I'd say we'll probably have one that's, you know, sort of measure that's based on the the heat stress, because we can actually do that accurately, and the other is going to be based on this sort of uh, something happened model, right? That something bad happened, we don't know what it is, but uh, you guys were consistent throughout it, and you guys were all over the place in your performance. Does that make sense? It, yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. Because um, that's something that we start, I think we're starting to see more and more um, in the dairy press as well about, you know, selecting the resilient cows, the anonymous cow. Um, mm -hmm. It's not going away by any means. How do we breed for them is the bigger question though, right? Yeah. And, and I think it's it sort of represents a mind shift from, um, you know, the historical way of trying to identify, you know, one uh, super animal and making everyone else you know, as close to super as possible. Well, that super animal requires sort of massive amount of daily attention and care. Maybe that's not great. Like, um, and I think some of the other species and, and have, you know, thought more about group performance and, and we're there now in, in dairy too, as farm sizes increase. Uh, you want a, a, a high performing group rather than, you know, a few elite individuals met next next to a bunch of others, right? So no, no, good stuff. And then um, final question for me. And again, um, people in the audience that type something into uh, the QA or chat by all means, um, if you have a question before we wrap up, uh, but looking maybe more bigger picture, the inclusion, the development of new traits has been a good thing for the industry. I mean, we have the data to show that we've been making genetic progress. The flip side of that, it can be information overload at some times of there's more and more traits to sort through and how do I balance all this? Um, so maybe for an individual farmer, or for those of us who are consulting with individual farmers, how do we get past the data overload to really fine tune, okay, what's really gonna make the best cow for me on my farm and how do I sort through this? Yeah, and that's where the index selection comes in, right? So um, sending out 50 traits to, um, to anyone to sort through would be would be an impossible situation. Try to do our best, put put uh, economic values on them, and you know put them into you know lifetime net merit or TPI or, or if you have jerseys JPI whatever you like. And and the sort of real practical advice I always give is you know if you start with the animals, let's say your sire selection, you start with the bulls ranked by the index, and you work your way down you. You know, we don't expect everybody's going to want to use the same, you know, 10 or 20 sires in their herd, and that would be bad, right? But if you start working your way down the list, you go, okay, this one's too expensive. This one's, uh, I don't like, uh, you know, uh, low fat percentage on this one and, you know, four udders on this one. By the time you get very down, far down the list, you're going to get kind of tired of that, right? And you're going to end up with a group of animals that meet your, you know, your specific criteria or, uh, challenges you have in your herd but if you're if you're working from a ranking index list um, you're never going to you know pick horrible animals that are uh, or sorry animals that are just average for everything and not really very good at anything right um, if that makes sense to so start with an index and then you know meet your specific needs from that list and you would not go wrong right? And then there's something about the slide back, the photo backgrounds or something as well, Ryan. You said a question. I did not. Maybe I yep. Read it. Um, and I need to pull it up That's again. Picture. Oh, <laughs> well, we have a um, mostly brown Swiss. It looks like there's a couple of Frisian animals in there that are, um, I think uh, it's the Mont Blanc in Switzerland or near there somewhere. Um, I try to diversify my office as an, as an aside. I had lots of 
cow stuff in here, and then we merged departments, animal and dairy sciences, and I was told I needed to uh, add diversity to my office walls as well. So I have I have an Angus bull, I have some uh, uh, Brahmin bulls, I have a chicken, uh, some goats, some puppies, and then these cows in the mountains. So, yeah. These are not UW cows, those are in Switzerland. That's good. That's the variety is the spice of life, right? Yeah, exactly. So. so with that, thank you so much for doing this today. We greatly appreciate it. It's good information. Things for us to look forward to as we see further developments, uh, again, on the resilience and the feed efficiency. It's two things that aren't going to go away anytime soon. Uh, but with that, feel free to contact us, um, contact Dr. Weigel if you have further questions. Um, but again, thank you for being on today. Please join us uh, again February 20th for our next Badger Dairy Insight, and we'll see you then. Thank you. Thank you.